Tulip. I know you've heard of this game. Look, who am I kidding? Chances are probably not. But if you have, odds are the first word that springs to mind is kissing. That's how it was marketed. And it's what's on the box. Perhaps the reason for this is that describing what genre developer Punchline's game is, is surprisingly difficult. It's a question that no doubt caused the marketing team a lot of headaches. But despite what they settled on, kissing game isn't exactly a genre, is it? That's just a thing that happens. So what kind of game is Tulip, really? While it has elements from adventure games, puzzle games, and even a little RPG, there's also a far more interesting genre that it belongs to. Tulip is, and always was, built on the foundations of what could have been one of the most innovative detective games of the era. So why is it so hidden then, huh? Well, that's where I, the backseat developer, come in. Being a person who plays games and talks about them on the internet, what option do I have but to impart a little of my own genius and backseat game dev this whole production? To do that, let's take a critical look at what Tulip did right, the things it didn't fully explore, and of course, what it did poorly. Then finally, I'll take my rightful place as the only correct person on the internet and cook up my own version of what a Tulip 2 would look like, making full and best use of what the first game had hidden up its sleeve. But when I say hidden up its sleeve, I do mean hidden. All that detective gameplay that I've hyped up is buried deep within Tulip. In fact, throughout the main story, it's almost entirely absent, which we'll see when we look at that now. Tulip begins with the protagonist in an open expanse with a talking tree. It's here that we give your character a name, as well as doing the same for the love interest. I'll just stick with the boy and the girl to keep things simple, but I'll go ahead and make things unsimple again by occasionally referring to him as you, as in the player. I just can't help it sometimes, so you'll have to bear with me. After the two of them agree to get married by the medium of tree, they kiss and the boy is jolted awake. Now, in reality, we see that the boy and his father are currently moving house and this is his first day settling into his new home and new neighbourhood. From here the game gives you a few tasks around town that introduces you to a few of the residents, which include a washed up busker, the owner of a local second hand shop, and a seemingly old lady gossiping with the local doctor. Given how the locals speak to the boy, he's clearly meant to be a downtrodden underdog, which is made all the more clear when the literal girl of your dreams appears. During all this, she mentions that in Long Life Town, you use the triangle button to kiss people. And at this point, the game won't progress unless you try and give her a kiss with that button. And you're deservedly rejected. So now the end goal of the game is clear, to win over the heart of the girl and achieve something close to what you saw in your dream. How you eventually settle on doing this is by writing a love letter, and after a brief tutorial teaching you how to sneak up on things, you write the love letter and deliver it. A little more of the map is opened up at this point and you get a chance to meet a few more of the townspeople, including the parents of the girl who are squabbling with each other over by their chicken shop, <laughs> a policeman and a train conductor, who both immediately profile you as a criminal because you're poor. <laughs> and elderly shopkeep Mrs. Plum, who is a total champ. <laughs> the most important part of this new area, however, is the post box, which you need to post your love letter. You deliver the letter, win the girl's heart, and complete the game. But actually, no. A trip into a manhole reveals that this voice belongs to Michio Suzuki, a local teacher and underground resident who's taken it upon himself to help us write a much better love letter. He informs us that our little baby heart is far too weak to write a good love letter. If you want to be a man with a big strong heart, we must gain experience by smooching as many dang lips as we can. Michio flips a table, allowing an abomination that's half onion, half elderly lady to surface, 
and thrusts the player into a makeshift kissing coliseum. Kissing a person in Long Life Town is all about waiting for the perfect moment and landing your kiss when that person is in Viva, a state of happiness indicated by music notes. Kiss when they're still angry and you'll get attacked, much like the girl did earlier. Move too fast towards an angry person and you'll also be attacked, much like the dog guarding the letter set. <laughs> Onion Lady's the first real kissing tutorial by combining these two rules. So you sneak up, wait for the right moment, and give her a kiss. This draws your first love lesson with Michio, as well as the tutorial to an end. With the first kiss under your belt, you return back to your freshly unpacked home and hit the hay. The reason, in gameplay terms, you're kissing all these people is to try and improve your max health. If you kiss enough people to cross a threshold, going to sleep will activate a sequence where you level up and gain more maximum health. The first level only needs one kiss, so as part of a tutorial, you're always going to level up one time, taking your hearts from 5 to 8. <laughs> I think the tutorial succeeds in a few minor ways and fails in one critical way which compounds throughout the entire rest of the game and is somewhat related to what we said earlier. Let's start with the positives. Teaching both halves of the kissing gameplay separately before teaching them together with Onion Lady is a great way to gently lead new players towards the steps of how to operate this pretty unfamiliar system in a low pressure environment. On the negatives however... What else has the tutorial spent any time teaching? The answer is... not much. Here lies the biggest problem of Tulip, a crisis of identity. While undoubtedly the story revolves around kissing people, the actual act of kissing someone is not required too often. And when it is required as part of the main quest, it actually happens automatically, without any interaction, it's basically a cutscene. This is true of all the plot-relevant kisses. Of course, the game does make use of this mechanic in a lot of its side content, so spending time teaching this would not be an issue if it were part of a larger tutorial that teaches the game's many, many systems, instead of simply acting as a story primer with a focus on the kissing minigame. A common complaint of the game is that the puzzles and kissing solutions are too obscure, even to an unfair degree, but I think for the vast majority of the game, People only really had trouble with these, because they weren't told to expect any of it. But that's something we're going to come back to later in much more detail. Back to the story now, and as soon as you wake up, it's revealed that your family are now officially accused of causing the boulder incident on the train tracks. For some reason, you're not immediately arrested, so your current objective is to sort out this whole mess before you are. Now you're in the game proper, and the game immediately drops several mechanics on you without telling you what they are or how they work. They are time management and the daily routine, and underground residence. Let's tackle time management first, as that's the most crucial to how the game works. Unlike the tutorial, which had time frozen at sunset, the rest of the game runs in a daily cycle, with people and events occurring across the whole game world on a predetermined routine. For example, at 1pm, Michelle will always harass Batayan as he busks in the town square. The second new mechanic are these holes that have appeared all over town. It seems that there are other people living underground, like Michio Suzuki, but unlike his house, there's no way to interact other than peeping inside. These residents are very short, puzzle-like encounters, much like Onion Lady in the tutorial, who only appear surface-side very briefly every day. They give a short hint message if you peek in their holes when they're home, which is intended to be used to deduce some specific action that the player needs to do to score the kiss. For example, Tin Signboard wants you to look at him, so you do that. However, while this is true in some, many are essentially copy-pastes of Onion Lady, mechanically speaking, and require no thought other than waiting for the correct moment for Viva, making the vast majority of underground residents incredibly basic. 
and for these ones you can ignore the fact I called them puzzles at all earlier. There are 50 individuals who can be kissed in the whole game of Tulip, and underground residents make up more than half of that number. Taking into account those who are kissed in cutscenes unavoidably as part of the main game story, without any kissing input, and Onion Lady in the tutorial, the game only actually has 13 residents who require the player to engage in any complicated problem solving or gameplay input. That's a problem. So let's add that into our list of ways we can improve Tulip 2. Increase the amount of engaging content. See? So easy. I don't know why they didn't just think of that. After exploring the town a bit, the player will no doubt try to activate this broken crosswalk near your home. If this does happen, during the next love lesson with Michio Suzuki, he'll fix the broken button, giving you the ability to cross the road and view a mission-critical cutscene. Throughout the game up until this point, you'll have encountered a talking and very angry telephone pole. That's funny. And here you discover the cause of his anger. He's a teacher called Dam Yamada, and Michio hasn't been paying him for his work at the school. Dan storms off, and as you keep exploring the town, you'll bump into him ranting and raving in various spots on the map. Concluding in what appears to be an attempt to end it all on the town's railway tracks. The explosive encounter results in the boulder being cleared off the track, solving one of our problems. But nothing is simple, and before running off for a nearby temple, Dan steals Michio's love letter set as severance pay, and is then promptly mugged by three other teachers. They now split the love letter set into three parts, the love paper, the love ink, and the love pen. To complete the game, the player now has to retrieve all three pieces of the love letter set, and create the love letter set once again, to smooch that girl. Worldly Desire Temple is a map with a large graveyard to the southwest, a temple raised on a hill to the northeast, and a small shrine in a cave to the east. The teacher who made himself home here lives inside a gravestone, and will only give the boy the love ink if the boy does something about the current head monk's annoying sounding gong. Yeah, that's, that's pretty annoying. After paying a small fee, oh, sorry, I mean donation to the temple, the monk tells you about a long-hidden, much better gong that once belonged to his father. To track it down, you'll be doing a lot of running backwards and forwards between the temple and Long Life Town. You'll need to buy a magnifying glass from Mr. Cheapot's second-hand shop, as well as buy some incense from the monk himself. Using the magnifying glass to read the tattoos on the monk's body, you'll be given a list of gravestones in a numbered order. Using the incense on these gravestones in that order will cause lightning to strike and reveal the better gong. <sighs> Much better. Of course, everyone loves it, including the teacher, and he awards you with the love ink. The lightning strike here deals 9 damage, and is a way for the game to check if you've leveled up at least one time since the tutorial. Otherwise, there's no way to survive it, you only have 8 health and this does 9 damage. These damage checks are really the only concrete gameplay motivation to make sure the player is actually playing the game and going out and kissing people. There only being one problem. This is the only one in the game. And to level up this second time, you only need to kiss two residents. This means it is possible for the player to complete the entire game kissing only the five mission critical NPCs. So to take that even further, this means the player can complete the game without ever actually pushing the triangle button at all after the tutorial which is a pretty big problem. So, let's add that to the list too. Find a way to make the player engage with kissing residents throughout the game. Chasing down the second teacher, the boy finds himself at Funnybone Factory, an impossibly enormous factory made up of many small maps connected by a tram system. To get our hands on this part of the letter set, we need to become a small business boy and achieve at least a project manager rank at the factory. But there's no way in, and they aren't hiring children. But by referring them a new hire, the boy can get a tour of the factory, and a one-day manager pass. So referring our neighbour and good friend Batea into the factory scores us that pass, which is mailed to the boy shortly afterwards. The one-day manager pass doesn't count as being a project manager, but it does let us get into the factory and scope it out a little bit. Yeah. 
turns out the factory is a hyper-capitalist hellscape. Every employee is an unremarkable identical drone, all of which are utterly convinced that they are just a few days away from promotion and will be president of the company if they just keep at it. <laughs> Employees are all given extremely specific and meaningless authority, which they take immense pride in. Even the boy, with his novelty daily manager sash, is apparently a higher rank than most of the employees, and everyone talks to him with a nervous respect. <laughs> to complete the nightmare, the work here is also mostly meaningless. Of the 999 factory floors, one third of the workers are employed to destroy said factories. Another third work in factories reclaiming scrap metal from the destroyed factories, and the final third work on rebuilding the destroyed factories, presumably from that scrap. During your questioning of the employees, you slowly begin to realise a few things. First, that the role of president is currently vacant, which we should keep an eye on, and that something extremely valuable is being held in a vault on one of the factory floors. But there are still several problems to solve to see what that is. The first problem being the tram operator blocking our access to the factory floor with the vault. And even getting to the tram is impossible while the boy is in the one day manager tour. To get to the vault at all, the boy needs to break out of a tour routine and explore the factory at his own pace. After more questioning, you'll eventually find a factory floor with a lazy security guard, which lets you find a hiding spot and stay in the factory after closing. But it's still not that easy. The safe can't be cracked, and there's no way to know the combination. Well, this is also solved by questioning the factory workers, as one of them will ask you to deliver a letter to one of his friends, who just so happens to be the former vault manager. Delivering that letter will net you another cutscene kiss, as well as the secret to the vault. The dial on the safe is a big old fake. The real dial is the entire factory, and riding the tram to various factory floors is how you actually input the safe combination. <laughs> Doing so will get you the boss card, and you are now the president of Funny Bone Factory. No questions asked. Showing off your new authority to the teacher in the oil drum nets you the love paper. The final piece of the love letter set is found at Scarecrow Field, a large area of farmland with a radio tower to the north and a junkyard to the west. The teacher here wants you to convincingly say you believe in aliens, and just saying you believe doesn't work, she can see through your lies. It's very lucky for the boy then that aliens do exist. And after a UFO crash, you can meet a brand new resident in Scarecrow Field, walking around in a diving suit. Obviously, he doesn't speak English, or Japanese for that matter, so to translate his speech, you'll need to source four alien dictionaries from around the entire game. And after doing so, the alien will reveal he needs a variety of items to build a machine that will send out an SOS. Giving all these items to the alien will mean he'll climb the radio tower and try to call home, but there's a problem. The machine isn't working. So you present a can of cola to it, and you're back on track. Hmm. After inserting the cola, the machine is working again. And now we're presented with a screen to input the code. Wait, the code? Do we, do we have a code? No, we do not. It turns out there was another item we needed, this time without direction. That being the star seeds, which are found in this part of this field on Scarecrow Field, and all you need to do with them are plant them in this part of this different field, don't plant them on the other part of the field or it won't work, and you will be rewarded with an extremely quick look at the solution. Why did they go away? So, get more star seeds, plant them again, and then note down their placements so you can go back to the machine and input the code.
This calls a spaceship, the alien says goodbye, and rewards you with the final, mandatory kiss of the game. With your new experiences, you sound convincing enough for the teacher to reward you with the final piece of the love letter set. With the letter set complete, you can finally write your good love letter. But there's a problem. Now the post box from earlier in the game doesn't work. So where do you post it? Well, once Dan, the talking telephone pole, gets the love letter set stolen by the other teachers, he decides to deal with his guilt by digging a big old hole in the local park. With each part you retrieve, he gets deeper and deeper until finally he's completed it. At this point we get a minor plot twist that your father is the principal and boss of the school where all these teachers are from, and has also been a weird goblin man like all the other teachers this whole time. It would seem like a lot of what's been going on, the letter set incident as a whole, the tasks you were given by various teachers, were all part of your father's plan to strengthen your heart and help you grow up. Maybe the policeman blaming our family for the boulder incident wasn't so wrong after all. The final part of their plan, apparently, requires you to cast yourself into this bottomless hole, so, you know, we're at this point, why even argue? Waking up at the bottom of the hole reveals a dreamlike realm that feels half like it's a world invented inside the boy's head, and half like it's actually a portal inside the girl's head. Gameplay in the hole consists of three sections, all of which test your knowledge of a town from the angle of the three people closest to the girl. First is the test of Goro, the girl's father. This one is quite easy, and all you need to do is pick out Goro's head from a lineup. Next up is the test of Julie, and this one is much harder. Julie runs a chicken restaurant, and even a casual player has probably discovered that every townsperson is just bursting to give her chicken a negative review at the slightest provocation. <laughs> well, now she has to pay for her cooking crimes as a court of chickens holds her on trial. To defend her innocence, you need to call witnesses who actually like her chicken and I hope you, the player, have been paying attention, or it's the death sentence for both of you. You're given all of the above ground residents to choose from except the girl, but only two of the residents apparently don't immediately projectile vomit as soon as Julie's chicken touches their lips. Those being Mrs. Plum and Michelle, which you can find out by showing them Julie's photo, but we'll go more into that sort of thing later. Everyone else will hilariously lay into Julie and demand she be killed as repayment for her subpar chicken. With those trials completed, it's time for the most difficult test of all, and you're forced to confront the person who knows the girl better than anyone. <laughs> to pass this test, you need to answer 20 randomly selected questions about the town and its residents. These are all incredibly specific, and it's very easy to mess up a few, even if you've been taking extensive notes. What do you mean the average player wasn't taking extensive notes in this kissing game? Not only that, but without engaging in the side content at all, even the most perceptive player will only be able to answer seven of these questions correctly, without having to resort to guessing and tanking the damage the cat deals out for wrong answers. If you do know what you're in for though, this is a tense and fun battle of attrition with the cat to see if he will run out of questions first, or you will run out of health. Prove your tulip chops and complete the cat quiz, and you've beaten the game. Now it's time to recreate the dream all the way from the beginning of the game. And in a nice touch, the boy isn't the one who delivers the kiss. Instead, it's the girl who makes the final move. And they all live happily ever after. So that's the main story, but before we get into making our own game, there's plenty more content to dig through. 
Although it's never formally told to the player, Tulip has a wealth of side content that is not only some of the more interesting stuff from a storytelling perspective, but also in terms of gameplay. And it's in this side content that Tulip flirts with some of the concepts and mechanics that we will nurture into a full-blown, free-form detective game for the sequel. So how is it that the side content is mechanically more interesting than the main game? Well, this is finally where the game starts to get a little detective-y. I know, nearly half an hour into the video. Early in the game there's a chance that Michio Suzuki gives the player a name card, an item that functions much like a business card. Upon trading your name card with another resident of a town, you'll receive theirs which gives you the ability to question anyone in town about that person. And there's a lot of information to gather, whether it's their personal history, some general gossip about them, or even some plot-critical information. The main quest ignores their existence for the most part, but the less structured side quests make plenty of use of them, and it's in this less structured, more free-form information gathering gameplay that I think Tulip, perhaps accidentally, hit a home run. It's sections like Mr. Cheapot's quest that really show how interesting completing these quests can be. Mr. Cheapot owns a local second-hand shop and most, if not all, of the poor side of town that the boy lives in. While he may own all this stuff, he still isn't happy, because he's lost one of his most important treasures. Somehow, a crane has managed to scoop up Mr. Cheapot's golden raccoon, which is more of a tanuki, and fled the scene. All Mr. Cheapot has to set you on your way is a crane feather and some low expectations. These side quests simulate in a very compelling way the feeling of being a detective, or private eye, as you take to the streets armed only with a few clues, in this case the crane's feather, and, if you're prepared, Mr. Cheapot's name card, and a whole town of people to question about them. This is probably one of the first side quests you'll encounter, so the game goes quite easy on you. It's only possible to begin this quest when Mr. Cheapot closes up his shop at night, and the game uses this fact to set you up for success as your next clue is right around the corner at the exact same time of day. During the night, the girl goes stargazing, and if you approach her for new clues, you'll be invited to join her, and upon doing so, you'll see the crane in the telescope. Combined with some comments from the girl, this confirms that the crane is in Long Life Town, and narrows down your search area immediately. Asking another nearby resident, Julie at the chicken shop, will net you even more interesting information. That her husband Goro had a run-in with the crane a few days prior, which she suspects is because of his laziness. Somehow. Talking to a hungover Goro, he alludes that this crane run-in was somehow linked to an event at Leo's tea party, but won't go into any more detail. This is further backed up by Vitean, who describes the crane as flying over to the same side of town as the bathhouse. Sounds like Leo has a few questions to answer for harbouring a criminal of the crane variety. Hey. And, yes, presenting him with a feather, he confirms that it does live on his roof. Which is all well and good, but how do we get up there? It seems we need some more information about Leo and his building. How are we going to get that? Well, by getting his name card. This opens up a whole new avenue of questioning that will itself inevitably open up even more avenues of questioning for the future, for both this quest and others. But progress isn't the only reward these side quests offer. There's heaps of character building, trivia and lore about the game's world that you stumble into by sticking your nose into other people's business and collecting all the gossip you can find. Showing Mr. Cheapot's card to the townspeople we've already mentioned in these few paragraphs reveals he does indeed own the empty lot the girl is hiding out in, but lets her stay there for free. He also has a history with both of her parents, being the chief of Julie's fan club, which in turn reveals that she was once a singer. And knowing that she's a singer explains all of these posters of her all over town, as well as the bizarre karaoke interlude before the chicken trial. Mr. Cheapot's card also reveals he was present during an argument when Julie threw away Goro's most precious film, this being a hint on how to start Goro's side quest. 
and if you've managed to get Mr. Cheapot's card before beginning his side quest, showing it to Batayan will even give you a hint on the conditions needed to start it. <laughs> but back to Mr. Cheapot's quest, to progress you show Leo's card to Goro which will reveal more details about that crane related incident during the tea party. In this he reveals some more information about how to get onto the roof with the crane. Apparently repeatedly kicking the boiler will do the trick. <laughs> So, you kick the boiler just like Goro said, head up to the roof, and retrieve the raccoon, or tanuki, and get a kiss for Mr. Cheapot. But, maybe the real treasure were the friends we made along the way. I actually mean that kind of unironically, if that's possible to believe. Doing a quest like this in Tulip begs you to have a notebook to make sure that every suspicious little tidbit you heard is written down and followed up on. This is where Tulip becomes a true detective game, unlike almost any other. Note, I haven't played every detective game, but I'm correct and you're wrong and I'll be taking no further questions, thank you. A common problem with detective games, or mysteries in video games in general, is how a game can give you the option to solve a mystery without accidentally revealing the solution to a player who hasn't figured it out yet. Tulip manages to achieve this by hiding its important information amongst its regular character building letting an uninformed player dismiss something as light humour that a player on the hunt for the truth might realise is actually the final piece of a puzzle that they've been building for hours. But what does this change about your relationship with Mr. Cheapot? Well, nothing, it turns out. You can now kiss him wherever you want with no punishment, he will say a nice thing to you when you do so, but in terms of gameplay, he still charges you full price for everything, and nothing more comes out of it. Kissing Leo allows you to access his tea parties, something that is used to complete another side quest later, and kissing the conductor allows you to buy a mostly useless and extortionately expensive unlimited train ticket. But these are the exception. Since you can complete the game without engaging in any of the side content, in our sequel, we're going to make sure that the player gets guaranteed benefits for kissing every resident. But I did say that these sections aren't just better in their gameplay, but also in their storytelling. There was a trend online that asked the question, why is millennial humour so weird? Now, weird depressed humour has been around for a long, long time, but this massive resurgence in recent years is unfortunate for Tulip, because that's a note it hits perfectly, just about a decade ahead of everyone else. Tulip is chock-a-block with quotes that if the game was released today, would be gaining massive traction on Twitter as extremely relatable content. Everyone is utterly miserable, despite the game's cartoony look, and the game features scenes of a lot of unpleasant things. And whatever the hell is happening here. <laughs> now, surely surprising at the time, but shouldn't really be surprising in hindsight, given that director Yoshiro Kimura's next game would be Rule of Rose, a game banned briefly in the UK for its extreme content. Unlike that game, however, and why I think Tulip works a lot better, is that the depressed, miserable exterior serves as a wrapper for a much more uplifting and positive message. As the player, you are capable of transforming all these people's lives. Let's start with one of my favourites, Batayan. Batayan is a deadbeat who lives in a trailer in the same poor part of town as you. He's unemployed and resorts to busking to make a living, but is rejected at every turn and can't seem to catch a break. He repeats several times that what he wants is to get a job and be rich. When you get Batayan the factory job as part of the main quest, he is ecstatic. But 
doesn't reward you with a kiss like you might expect. Why? Because what he actually needs is to be happy, not be rich. And he's actually made a terrible mistake by thinking they were the same thing. Bataillon's life becomes miserable after you get him that job. If you follow him on his routine, you'll see his long commute means he spends all day either working or travelling to work, and only gets four hours of sleep before doing it all again. He's become so beaten down at this point that he resigns himself to working this way for his whole life, knowing he's unhappy. <laughs> Once you complete Funny Bone Factory as part of the main quest, you can return to the factory as the president and fire him. The burden taken off him, Bataillon realises that making music, even if it doesn't get him money or fame, is actually what makes him happy. And when finally coming to terms with this, he gives you the kiss. Whereas before he was embarrassed and defensive when given money while busking, now he accepts it and even embraces it singing you an extra song. <laughs> Bataillons is a story that I think we can all relate to, to some extent. And it's not a fluke. Almost all the side content packs a similar punch. Dr Dandy is a doctor so obsessed with the idea of helping other people and being the perfect image of health that he doesn't accept that he needs help, just like everybody else. As he says, doctors don't get sick. But this destructive way of living is taking its toll and it's totally burnt him out. Even worse, he actually does need someone to help him. And he's in fact the most seriously sick of anyone in town. <laughs> it's when you discover the truth to his sickness, play doctor and make some medicine to cure him for once, that he becomes truly happy and the quest is completed. It's stories like both of these, and many many more, which is why Tulip is able to contain a lot of darkness without being totally lost within it. The game balances its bleak, depressed, melancholy tone with a splash of optimism. While it acknowledges that everyone is trapped in a cage of their own making, it says that while everyone's happiness is unique, everyone can find theirs. As the game's director Yoshiro Kimura said in an interview with Hardcore Gaming 101, each of the characters, whether a child, adult, student, teacher, office worker, muscle man, drunkard, is feeling and dealing with that heavy invisible wall. I sometimes think about how every person feels like a bird in a small cage at some point. Adults can sometimes live their whole lives without ever really noticing that birdcage. Tulip says, don't be ashamed of what makes you happy, no matter how weird or niche it is. Do you love being the centre of attention? Do you really love trains? Or maybe you're really into S&M. No judgement here. Be whoever you want to be. Just don't kiss people without permission. That will get you punched. As I've said before, Tulip is a game with a slight identity crisis. Some of the best parts of the game are completely unadvertised. As I'm aware, as a backseat game developer, genius and also having the internet, games often come together at the last minute. Combined with the sheer amount of cut content described in the official guide, I'm putting all my money on the system being accidentally good, and that the game was planned to just be a regular adventure game whose side content accidentally became the most interesting part of the game. However, how this manifests in the game is that the tutorials and introductions to these systems are almost entirely absent. It's only during your first in-game day, when the sun is already setting, that the game gives you your first chance to learn about name cards, assuming you remember to revisit Michio. During your conversation with him, he gives the player the option to learn the three rules of love. Three totally optional dialogue prompts that are entirely skippable. It's the third of these options where the game will tell you the most it ever will about the name cards, as well as giving you one for free to start you off. Given how essential these are for the best gameplay found in Tulip, 
as well as basically being mandatory to even beat the final test of the game, this exchange should really have been mandatory, and ideally integrated into the tutorial of the first day. To demonstrate how important this was to teach, let's take a look at one of the few puzzles of the main story that requires using their name cards and all your detective skills to solve. Retrieving the fourth alien dictionary from this hole. If the game has done its job up until this point, and players understand the many systems of Tulip, then the Let's Players of the internet should have no problem at all solving this one on their own. But she has to be at this crack behind the police station as the bell chimes at five chewing gum to get the last alien dictionary. Now why that is, is beyond me. Why does that only work at five? <laughs> That's a really great question. Who knows how somebody figured that out? Not, not even sure. Oh. But the thing is, the game does give you all the clues you need. And here's how. If you show the girl an alien dictionary, she tells you that she saw a book just like it in the hole behind Mrs. Plum's shop. Showing Mrs. Plum's card to Batayan will also get you started on the same breadcrumb trail. Investigating that hole tells you you need to be much smaller to get inside. The only item that has anything to do with being small is the micro gum, which is sold in Mrs. Plum's shop. If you show this micro gum to Julie, Leo, or the girl, you'll be given a breadcrumb trail that will lead you to everything you need to know. Show it to the girl, and she'll tell you that her mother is scared of micro gum for some reason that she doesn't know about. Hi. Showing the gum to Julie, you'll be told the story of a child who disappeared many years ago while chewing that micro gum. In her telling of events, she describes the time of day it happened and mentioned that her childhood friend Leo was also there. In his version of a story, he'll tell you exactly where you need to chew the micro gum to repeat the event. Now you have all the information you need to get inside that hole and an idea of what will be found inside. But in some ways, isn't that worse? The game has this fantastic information gathering mechanic that gives you all the answers you could hope for, and... This game is pure madness. Pure madness. How on earth would you know that you had to be there as the clock struck five in order to become micro? Even the most passionate players have no idea it exists. So that's for sure going right on our list, emphasizing the importance of name cards early on. And that's a pretty beefy looking list now. Looking back on the content of the game as a whole, I think it's safe to say that the side content, with the above ground residents like Batayan and the rest, is the strongest part of the game, and the underground residents are the clear shoe in for the worst content of the game. The main quest is far less consistent with its quality, which makes it quite difficult to rank, but one consistent thing about it is that it rarely ever utilises the game's more unique and interesting systems. To give Scarecrow Field a little bit of a closer look, this is where the main story most desperately tries to hide its routine progression by layering on so much obtusity, obtuseness, that it becomes completely incomprehensible. I regret to inform you, you are now entering the Funny Cola Conundrum. I have completed Tulip 100% got all the secret items, shown as many things to as many residents as I can. I've bought the official strategy guide, only available in Japan, and translated it into English, so I feel confident in saying, there is nothing in the game at all that tells you to use a can of funny cola to fix the alien's machine. That being said, there are tantalising little morsels that keep me thinking, no, no, there's got to be one more line of dialogue I'm missing. The first person to solve this has to have known somehow. So I watch a few more Let's Plays, only to find out they're getting their information from online guides. Looks like it's time to check those guides, but no, they do not explain why you need to do what you need to do. So that's a dead end. Maybe then you're just supposed to figure it out from context. The solution is so obvious, there's no need to explain. But for that to happen, you need to be able to assume as a player that the can can be put into the tube next to the computer. Also, that the can will now travel across the map to the building by the river, and that it will grow ten times in size. And then that it will somewhat resemble an old music box, and that a music box is even what the goal of this whole thing was, to fix a computer. 
So maybe not contextual clues. Well, maybe there are clues that funny cola in general is connected to space somehow, and you just show it to loads of people like you did the microgum, and eventually someone will say, oh yeah, they drink that out in space, and you'll take a leap of faith and use it with something to do with space. No. Well, then maybe the game expects you to get stuck, that the alien will eventually ask you for one more item to make his machine work. It's just a waiting game. No. The alien doesn't change his lines, he will always say the same thing. But this is where the answer to the funny cola conundrum actually feels so close. In the alien dictionaries, there does exist a word for Can's juice. So, why doesn't he say that in any of his dialogue then? Could this be a translation issue? There's some evidence for that. The game has several moments where the translation is just a little bit off and some occasions which are extremely rare, where dialogue is completely garbled. Does the alien give a hint in Japanese clear as day that the English version messes up? There's actually precedent for this exact thing. Several essential clues for side quests appear to just... cut off. There's even a case of this for the microgum quest that we've just finished complimenting, if you show Mrs Plum's card to the girl. I think this is all looking like a very real possibility. So, let's leave English behind for a moment, and let's turn to some Japanese resources. Starting with the relevant pages from the official strategy guide, and looking for any hint of cola. The page that describes how to kiss the alien? No mention. So what about the page that describes Scarecrow Field in general? No mention. As far as the guide is concerned, the cola is either not part of a solution at all, or it's so obvious that it doesn't even need to be explained. So enough reading, let's go straight to the source. So I got in contact with the game's director and asked him, how is the player supposed to know how to use the can? This was his response. Soda can is heno coke in Japanese text maybe? In this case, it will connect to the face of Heno Heno Factory. So I took this message and I tried a new approach, a hunt for clues at Funnybone Factory. And he's right, the name of the cola is indeed Heno Cola, but what could he mean by the face of the factory? If you think it could mean the front of the factory, or even any of the walls, that's not the answer. So maybe it's not the face of the factory, but maybe it's the face of the workers. This repeated face for all the factory workers is called Heno Heno Meheji, and is actually a well-known doodle that school kids will make using Japanese characters. Think of it like the Japanese cool S. It's also used for generic faces like scarecrows, Ooh. but let's face it, that more strongly connects the cola to the hundreds of faces of the people in Funny Bone Factory than it does to Scarecrow Field. And with that, the funny cola conundrum comes to an end, unresolved. I think with this much work put in, and no clue to be found, it's only fair to assume that this isn't solvable by any other means than trial and error. Obviously, this being a kiss of death for the adventure game that Tulip was intended to be, and also, equally, terrible for being the detective game it could have been. To avoid having too many negatives in a row, so before we talk about the critical reception to the game, let's talk about the assorted little positive things that Tulip does that I couldn't fit in anywhere else. Each of the maps featured in the game has a hidden resident. Long Life Town has this Popeye fella who we saw earlier. <laughs> Worldly Desire Temple has this panda who only appears for a few hours a day and heals you when you look at it. Scarecrow Field has an invisible man who wanders around at night. <laughs> and Funny Bone Factory has this. If you show the girl a photograph of her mum, she'll describe a bad dream she had which foreshadows the chicken trial at the end of the game. On the subject of name cards, Zombie Mika, a time-frozen soul of a long-dead teen who was childhood friends with Julie and Leo, has such bad eyesight that she can't read name cards. However, if you show her Julie's picture, she will comment on it being a picture of Julie's mother, being unaware that Julie has since grown up. Tragic as hell, but is a lovely detail. 
Also on the subject of Mika, the temple's stained glass window features her likeness, as well as another slightly supernatural being who can also be kissed on this map. If you get yourself arrested and sentenced to death in the graveyard as part of both the policeman and Julie's quest, and then you talk to the policeman again after you escape from the grave, he'll congratulate you on your resurrection. In the same quest, you're required to break into the chicken shop and steal Julie's special hairpin. Showing her this item after the quest is complete also gives you a unique reaction. There's a photo album in the boy's house that shows what every resident you've kissed has been up to, which is very cute. And the boy can also receive mail from certain underground residents post-kiss. There are also a few secrets that are equally amusing and gruelling to discover, like digging through piles of poo to discover a secret film, and taking a 96 damage hit from the Grim Reaper for a secret ring. Seriously, this one was goddamn ridiculous. And one final thing is about a piece of the map that we haven't seen yet. Across the small bridge behind Leo's bathhouse, you can actually reach the lover's tree anytime you want after the boulder incident. However, doing so before delivering the good love letter set at the end of a game will result in a special cutscene where the boy is rejected. So that's a pretty in-depth summary of the content of Tulip, and I think once you know where to look for the good stuff, the scales absolutely tip on the side of Tulip being a forgotten classic. So why did it fail critically, apart from obviously the fact that I didn't make it? And believe me, it was received very poorly. I do think Tulip has some flaws, especially in its later puzzle design, but if I'm betting money, I wouldn't say it's the funny cola conundrum that was the deal breaker for someone over at, say, 1UP. I think the game's focus on the kissing element and aversion to explaining its other elements at all created an assumption for a lot of players and critics that ate away at their enjoyment the entire time they were playing. That assumption being that every gameplay mechanic that isn't directly kissing focused is just some sort of obstacle or nuisance that's stopping them from getting to the kiss. The punchline. Tulip as a whole is tedious and frustrating. You may enjoy a brief rush of adrenaline when you finally kiss someone, but it's only because getting there was so painful. Tulip has many elements that are creative and well implemented, such as the daily cycle, which has recently become a subgenre all of its own. Clockwork games. These include games like Hitman and Hitman 2. It's an extremely compelling way to build a sense of character and place, but this game wasn't sold on the clockwork town. There is a clock in the upper corner keeping track of the passage of in-game time. Certain tasks can only be completed at specific times of day, which is hardly intuitive. Since the boy is very fragile, and you can only save your game and lock in progress in toilets or beds, players really need to plan out their days. It's tough, but that's not a bad thing. It's really an effective way of adding tension to progression and encouraging a little risk-reward forethought. But it wasn't sold on being hard, was it? Your character is also rather fragile, especially at the start of the game. It's no fun, especially since you have to travel back to a specific location to save your game. The team over at Punchline created a game that featured a lot of very solid and ahead of their time concepts, but that's not what it was sold as. To make things worse, when the game finally did come out in the West in 2007, people were looking for games to break different kinds of ground. The jump to HD had happened, and people were playing the likes of Bioshock, Mass Effect, Uncharted. I suspect when reviewers were forced to take time out of their day to play a game marketed as a novelty adventure game on the dusty old office PlayStation 2, they were already in quite a sour mood. So, when Tulip inevitably required the player to give it a little bit more patience, or maybe spend an hour just gathering some information and taking notes, I can imagine that reviewers weren't best pleased. Tulip is probably one of the most poorly designed games I have ever played. When considering if critics really gave this game a fair shot at the time, I think it's worth noting that twice as many critics actually bothered to review the B-Movie video game on the Xbox 360 and the B-Movie game scored higher. We're here. We made it. It's time to find the worst possible posture we can and do some backseat game development. So, let's imagine for a second Tulip 2 has been confirmed. 
Kimura and his team over at Onion Games have been totally killing it with sales of their old RPG Moon on the Switch, and they've got a massive budget, and they decide to spend it on Tulip 2. So how do we make sure it's a 90 on Metacritic and a big old sales success? And how do we deliver on the promise of the investigations and social systems that were built into the first game? Well, we've got a list, so let's start building. First, what are we going to keep the same? Well, I think we'll keep the daily cycle and the map with roaming NPCs. The next thing we'll be keeping, as much as it pains me, is the kissing. Look, I think it would be crazy to try and make a Tulip 2 and it not to be about kissing people to some degree. That's just what it's known for. But where we can start making changes is how the kissing is now more clearly contained to short set pieces at the end of quests. Mm. and is not advertised as the main gameplay mechanic. So that's what we're keeping the same, but now let's move on to what we're not only going to keep, but actually emphasize. For Tulip 2, our main gameplay loop will be the result of heavily expanding the name card system and using them to investigate people, places, and other leads. So, instead of just being told about them in passing and then expected to buy our own name cards one at a time, now name cards of residents are permanent upgrades that are added into your brand new inventory screen. Yeah, we'll also have to add a pause menu. The first game didn't have one of those. Now, anytime you talk to a townsperson, you will always have the option for them to tell you about, which brings up a subscreen with all the people whose cards you've collected so far. So how exactly are you collecting these name cards then if you're not just buying your own cards and trading them? Well, since in Tulip 2 investigations are now the core gameplay, everything is going to loop back into that, and this is no different. Now, smaller scale investigations into the residents are required to get their name card. These miniature versions of their four quests act as an introduction to the character, as well as a taste of what you may have to do to make them achieve Viva. Using the residents of Tulip 1 as an example, want to get Julie's card? Then you'll have to buy and enjoy some of her disgusting burnt chicken tanking the health hit, and putting on a brave face. If you manage to do that, she'll be pleased and give you her card to spread the good word for her store. After engaging with a resident like this and getting a taste of their character, you're now a bit more invested in that person, and suddenly asking about them around town feels a bit relevant. Why is her chicken so bad? Does everyone else like it or hate it? And no doubt you'll find out much more that you weren't expecting along the way. And that's not all the use the name cards have. Now, you'll be able to respond to statements or accusations made by other characters with a name card. After all, if you're going to put someone under suspicion, you have to actually know who they are. Because of this, it's highly encouraged to introduce yourself to as many characters as possible to widen your dialogue options for the rest of the game. So you meet a resident, complete their short side quest, and you get their name card. But what comes next? In Tulip 2, investigating and improving the lives of those around you is rewarded constantly, with gameplay benefits as well as story ones. Now, your relationship with each resident functions like a stripped down confidant or social link system from the Persona games, except in this case with three tiers. If you're ranked as a stranger, that means you haven't interacted with them in any major way. You get no benefits from knowing them and you can't talk about them in conversations with others. If you're ranked as an acquaintance, it means you've completed their introduction quest and got their name card. You can now talk about them with others, and you receive some benefits from being aware of who they are. Finally, the top rank is Admirer. This requires full completion of their individual quest, and is about as involved as getting their kiss would be in the first game. You'll also gain a solid gameplay advantage by knowing a resident in this way. That can range from unlocking a new area, to a constant improvement to your character's abilities or buffs. For example, and to pull from the first game again, if Mr. Cheapot is an admirer of yours, he may give you a mission critical item for free. Whereas if you're only an acquaintance, he'll still charge you for it. And if you're a stranger, it's not even for sale. That system is now a lot more involved than before, but the player will have a much clearer idea of how to actually interact with it, thanks to the gameplay now being fully tutorialized. The major way we'll be improving the tutorial is by instead of teaching how to kiss an underground resident, which was the case in the first game with Onion Lady, ours will walk you through a simple version of the new gameplay loop for kissing an above ground resident. Let's say a young girl, the same age as your character is blocking your way and talking to them will trigger their introduction quest. She will not move and the player will only be given contextual clues from the surrounding area and what she says to decide how to mitigate her circumstances and make her move. 
deducing what it is you need to do and taking action, you'll rank up to an acquaintance. You'll have made a new friend and received their name card, your first in the game, but she's still not budging. According to her, she's grateful to an extent, but she doesn't like you that much. She still needs to stay where she is. So, much like the first game, you've got to just double back and talk to Dad. And upon doing so, he'll let you know that there's another stage you can reach with someone, but it requires knowing that person inside and out and helping them reach their true happiness. Luckily for you, the name card you've just received is exactly the item you need. So you're encouraged to explore the area available to you and gather information about them, asking everyone in the area what they know about her and her situation. Upon doing so, you'll find out the reason why she's standing in your way and can't move from that spot, and once you solve it and relieve her of her burden, she reaches true happiness, viva, and gives you your kiss. Tulip 2 will now progress in this way for the rest of the game, focused entirely on above ground residents and the act of learning their daily routines and realising their dreams. This focuses on the strongest parts of the first game and ditches the underground residents entirely. The game will be split into various areas of town, each with an important figure that has information or resources the boy needs to progress the main story. To get on their good side, you'll need to fully engage with the community surrounding them, build relationships, follow every lead you can, and pull together all the information you need to smooch that person, make them a valuable admirer, and progress the plot. And how you achieve that goal is non-linear and freeform, with various different routes to uncover the information you need to make an admirer of this VIP. If the player decides to focus on the VIP's closest friends, they may gather the information, but at a slightly greater difficulty. Or, instead, maybe they poke around some of the other parts of town, and maybe make an admirer of someone who has access to a hidden route, within which the player can overhear the same information more covertly. All this progress is easily tracked on another tab of the pause menu, which will display your current rank with every townsperson. Filling out these character entries in their entirety is something for completionists and lore aficionados to have fun with once they're finished with the main plot. But what is the plot? This is a sequel to Tulip, so what happens after Tulip? Well, according to the game's director in the strategy guide, after the events of the game, the boy probably just moves again to a different town with different people, so that's exactly what we're going to do in our Tulip 2. Another idea that the strategy guide said was shelved was that the teachers were originally bad students, or bullies, who ruled over their own zones and were effectively the boss of each area. So we're going to return to that idea for Tulip 2. This is the story pitch for how I see it going. The game sees the boy pack up his belongings and move once again, this time to a much bigger city. The tutorial day is your first walk to school, which just so happens to be the last day of term. You go to school and meet the cast of bullies, teachers, and other eccentric characters who make up the town. However, upon returning home with your new friend, your father is missing. Searching everywhere only finds one mysterious clue to the truth behind your father's disappearance. But what does it mean? The boy is forced into an investigation that spans his entire summer vacation and takes him all across the city into each of the bullies' domain. Starting with just one ally and friend, you'll expand your army of admirers until the entire city is on your side. And together, you'll all find the truth about the boy's father's disappearance. So that's my backseat development of Tulip 2 over. Do you think this was the right direction to go in, or would you have done it differently and worse than I did? If you have an improvement to make Tulip 2 even better than what I described, then let me know in the comments. Also, while you're down there, let me know if this video made you curious enough to find a way to play the first game for yourself. If you give it a try, you may well be the first person to ever solve the funny cola conundrum. So go ahead and buy a copy, or at least buy one of the developer's more recent games. Let's just focus on getting them the money that could maybe make Tulip 2 actually happen. And maybe this time it really will be one of the best detective games ever made. You know, on purpose this time. Thanks everybody for joining me on this first episode of Backseat Game Development. Yes, I decided to kick off my channel by talking about Tulip, a game that almost nobody knows about. So if you watched it all the way to the end and you liked it, then give me a subscribe because very few people have probably made it this far. And follow me over on Twitter at Backseat Game Dev. Thanks once again, and I'll see you next time.